All right, welcome back. We are going to start this lecture with a mashing exercise. Here we are looking at movement disorders. I wanna see if you can match the movement disorder with its correct associated features. So hit the pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answers. All right, here are the correct answers. If you need to fix anything, of course, hit the pause button. Um, just to make sure you understand everything, let's go through each one of these real quick. So first is akathisia. This is characterized by an inner feeling of restlessness, kind of like an inability to sit still. Now, a patient might tell you they've got this feeling of nervousness, uh, uneasiness, or even restlessness. And usually this is caused by certain medications, especially those used in Parkinson's disease and as well as those used for schizophrenia. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that this can often cause a patient to become anxious because it's so uncomfortable, but it's more subjective and it actually lacks an actual underlying disorder. Then we have asterixis. Now this is a flapping motion that's seen in the hands and it results from rapid wrist extension. And this is associated with things like metabolic abnormalities, um, hepatic encephalopathy, uh, as well as Wilson disease, which don't forget is inherited how? Wilson's disease is autosomal recessive. Do you remember which gene is affected in Wilson disease? It's the ATP7B gene, which provides the instructions for making the copper transporting ATPase2. And that of course helps to transport copper from the liver through the body. Next up is athetosis. This is caused by a basal ganglia lesion that results in a slowed writhing motion. It's most often seen in the fingers. Now, do you remember which condition this is most likely associated with? Hopefully you said Huntington disease. Korea is next. This is also due to a lesion of the basal ganglia that results in sudden uh, jerking motions. And we typically see this in Huntington disease. Then we have dystonia. Dystonia is characterized by sustained involuntary muscle contractions. Now think of things like torticollis when thinking of dystonia. Now as the matching exercise pointed out here, this can be treated with Botox injections. Next up is a central tremor. Uh, this is characterized by a fine tremor of the hands and it's exacerbated by movement and worsened with anxiety. Oftentimes this is genetic, but the inheritance uh, typically varies. So in families where several people are afflicted, you'd usually think that's inherited in an autosomal dominant manner because remember autosomal dominant conditions are passed uh, much more readily, whereas autosomal recessives are going to be uh, less frequent. You'll see skip generations and things like that. Now remember, a telltale sign of this is that it goes away or at least gets better when someone drinks alcohol. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Now we can also manage this with a non-selective beta blocker like uh, propranolol. We can also use barbiturates. Intention tremors next. And of course, unlike the essential tremor, which is high frequency, the intention tremor is slower and it presents itself uh, when a patient is intentionally reaching out for their desired target. So you wanna look for sort of a zigzag type of motion with this type of tremor. This is of course associated with dysfunction of the cerebellum. Now resting tremor is the next tremor type and we see this of course at rest, but it is alleviated with movement. Now the cause of this is a lesion of the substantia nigra. Of course, this would be associated with which condition? Parkinson's disease. Hemibolismus is next. This is a lesion that causes wild and sudden flailing of one side of the body. And this is due to a lesion of the subthalamic nuclei and affects the opposite side of the body. Myoclonus is next. This is characterized by an uncontrolled sudden and brief muscle contraction. You can typically associate with this with a certain metabolic abnormalities. And finally, the last thing here is restless leg syndrome. This is a subjective sensation in the legs that creates an urge to move. Now, one of the main features of this is that it worsens at night when the patient is trying to fall asleep, um, which obviously makes it very annoying to have. And this can actually be due to an iron deficiency uh, and can be managed with things like dopamine agonists. Okay, um, let's move on to the next question. We've got an image here, so go ahead and hit the pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. correct answer here is D. So what are we dealing with here? These symptoms are classic to Parkinson's disease, which include any of the following. A pill rolling tremor, which remember is going to occur at rest. Rigidity, specifically cogwheel rigidity. 
akinesia, postural instability, shuffling gait, and micrographia, which is, of course, small handwriting. So what causes Parkinson's disease? Well, it's caused by a loss of dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra. Now, don't forget about the link between Parkinson's disease and MPTP, which is a prodrug of the MPP neurotoxin, which destroys those dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, and it leads to permanent symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Now, keep in mind that when it comes to management, the drugs used will depend on the type of characteristics that are being displayed by your patient which means there's not a single most preferred type of therapy. With that said though, there's four main classes of drugs with anti-Parkinson activity. They are the MAOB inhibitors, the dopamine agonists, amantadine, which is of course an antiviral, and levodopa. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Multiple choice, that means hit your pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is B. So don't forget, Huntington disease is a genetically inherited movement disorder that's inherited in an autosomal dominant manner, and it's characterized by a repeat expansion of the Huntington gene, which is found on which chromosome? Chromosome four. Now, this is one of the genetic conditions that demonstrates the anticipation phenomenon, which means it develops earlier and earlier in subsequent generations. Um, as that CAG repeat expands, it will develop earlier and earlier, and it can be more severe in subsequent generations. Now, as a result of the abnormality here, patients develop atrophy of the caudate amputamen with ex vacuo ventriculomegaly. Now, patients will experience neuronal death via NMDA R binding and glutamate excitotoxicity. And the abnormal neurotransmitter findings will include an increase in dopamine, a decrease in GABA, and a decrease in ACH. Now, the symptoms of Huntington's disease are usually seen anywhere from 20 to 50 years of age, and they consist of any of the following. Chorea, which we discussed earlier, is characterized by sudden jerky movements. Athetosis, which you should recall is characterized by a slow, writhing motion, as well as the onset of dementia, aggression, and depression. All right, let's move on to the next question. It's a multiple choice, so please hit your pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is C. So let's talk about Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common cause of dementia in the elderly. And of course, that means for the US MLEs, it is a super high yield topic. So let's first look at the main findings that you're going to need to look out for, which include things like memory loss, confusion, difficulty organizing thoughts, difficulty with logic, diminished attention spans, an inability to learn new things, trouble reading, trouble writing, and trouble using numbers. Now, there's a long list of potential findings, but those are some of the main ones that you want to look out for. Now, one super important point I want to make before we proceed is that in older people, depression looks very similar to Alzheimer's disease. So it's always important that we inquire about depression when we're faced with an older individual who has some of these common signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, let's look at some of the genetic info we need to know. So first, don't forget that patients with Down syndrome are at an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease due to the location of that APP gene, which is of course linked to early onset Alzheimer's disease. Where is this gene? Of course, it's on chromosome 21. And with three copies of chromosome 21, Down syndrome patients simply have a significantly increased risk. There's just more of it. There's also an association between the development of Alzheimer's and the APOE proteins, where we have an increased risk of the sporadic form with an alteration of the APOE4 protein and a decreased risk with an alteration of the APOE2 protein. Now, some additional findings that we need to be on the lookout for when we suspect that a vignette is trying to point us in the direction of Alzheimer's will include things like widespread cortical atrophy, especially at the hippocampus. As well, we'll see narrowing of the gyri and widening of the sulci. Also look out for the presence of senile plaques in the gray matter Ultimately, these can increase the risk of what? Intracranial hemorrhages. Neurofibrillary tangles, which are intracellular hyperphosphorylated tau proteins. This creates an insoluble cytoskeletal element, and the more that there are, the greater the correlation to dementia. We also have something known as Hirano bodies. These are intracellular eosinophilic proteinaceous rods, and these will be found in the hippocampus. Now, don't forget, we've also got a condition known as PIC disease. This is also known as frontotemporal dementia. 
Now this is characterized by degeneration of the frontotemporal lobe, and you'll see the presence of hyperphosphorylated tau or ubiquinated TDP43. And patients with this condition will typically demonstrate early changes in both their behavior and their personality, and they may develop primary progressive aphasia. We can also see the development of movement disorders in this condition. All right, let's move on. Next up, we have a matching exercise. So hit that pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, here are your correct answers. If you need to fix anything, hit that pause button. Otherwise, let's finish off these disorders by first discussing Lewy body dementia. So Lewy body dementia is caused by the development of intracellular Lewy bodies found primarily where? In the cortex. And as a result, patients develop a variety of findings, such as visual hallucinations, dementia with cognition and alertness that waxes and wanes, Parkinsonism, and REM sleep behavior disorder. And that's an interesting condition because the patient will physically act out their dreams with vocalizations and violent live movements during their REM sleep. This is, of course, why um, the muscles typically stop working during REM because we're dreaming or we're having nightmares. In this case, they can actually act it out. That is very dangerous, very dangerous, not only for the patient, but for the person sleeping next to them. Now, there's a bit of tricky diagnostic criteria here. So I really want you to be very careful when you're reading a vignette and you see dementia because the way by which you diagnose this is if the cognition and the motor symptoms develop within one year apart. If they don't, then what we're gonna do is diagnose this as dementia secondary to Parkinson's disease. Next is vascular dementia. This results from the presence of multiple arterial infarcts and chronic ischemia. Now, as it worsens, the patient will experience a consistent decline in their cognitive abilities. This is followed by late onset memory impairment. Now, one of the ways by which you could be hinted to this in a vignette are with either CT or MRI findings. They will demonstrate multiple cortical and or subcortical infarcts. Then we have creutzfeldt jakob disease. This, of course, is a rapidly progressing and fatal spongiform disease whereby the brain basically just develops these vacuolizations. I want you to look for a vignette mentioning exposure to possible contaminants and or an EEG or CSF findings uh, that, that give us the, the hint that this is what we're dealing with. So on EEG, what you'll see are uh, periodic sharp waves. And in the CSF, you will see an increase in the 1433 protein. Now don't forget, this condition is associated with beta pleated sheets that are resistant to the effects of proteases, which is why it just gets worse and worse. And finally, we've got HIV associated dementia. This of course is linked to HIV. Now grossly, I want you to be on the lookout for diffuse atrophy of the gray matter, as well as the subcortical regions. Now the patient with HIV-associated dementia will also develop gait disturbances, cognitive deficits, irritability, and depression. All right, let's do one more question before we end this lecture on multiple choice. Go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, the correct answer here is A, let's talk about idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which you might also be seeing referred to as pseudotumor cerebri. Now, the main characteristic of this condition is a rise in ICP without any visuals on imaging that would tell us why it happened. Now, there's of course a handful of risk factors associated with this. Female gender is one, obesity is one, uh, an excessive use of vitamin A is one, the use of tetracyclines is one, uh, the use of danazole is one. This is also associated with cerebral venous sinus stenosis. So what are the main signs and symptoms we really need to recognize in order to quickly identify that this is being given to us in a vignette? Well, the main thing is a headache. You also see tinnitus and you see diplopia, which don't forget is usually due to cranial nerve six palsy. And just as a reminder, do you remember what we'll see in a cranial nerve three palsy? I've mentioned it many times during this lecture already. You'll see ptosis and you'll see an eye that is what? down and out. Okay, you'll also see a pupil that simply will not respond to light. If we check this patient's vision, we're going to be, be able to identify uh, peripheral constriction as well as the presence of enlarged blind spots. If we do a lumbar puncture, we will see what? We will see an increased opening pressure. And one of the things that I want you to watch out for in a vignette that will really help you nail this diagnosis down 
is the relief of the headache right after we do the lumbar puncture. So we've met our diagnosis. How do we treat it? Well, first and foremost, get the patient to lose weight because obesity is a risk factor. Then we need to look at any offending agents and stop them. So if they're taking vitamin A, uh, we, can, we can have them stop the vitamin A. Um, a drug that we can use to release some of that pressure would be a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, such as acetazolamide. All right, let's end that lecture there. I'll see you guys on the next lecture. Thank you.